<clears throat> and and we're gonna let's let's dunk some people. What do you think? Let's let's do some of that. Let's right. Let's do that. You ready for this? You ready, David? Come on, he's excited about Jesus. Anybody else in here excited about Jesus? I'm excited about Jesus. So this is David, and David, uh, he came to the church. How long have you been coming here now? For about two, three months? Two months. Two months. And uh, every once in a while you meet someone like, that's on fire. So don't get too close to him because you might catch him on fire, right? But he's on fire for Jesus, and it, there's his folks. Come on in now. Come on in. Make yourself comfortable. We won't do anything without you. We're just bragging on your son. Is that okay? They've been waiting a long time for this. Yeah? I bet. Yeah. I bet you they said a few prayers. Mom, do you ever say a few prayers for this kid? A few hundred thousand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Don't ever give up praying. So, so I, I met David, and, and unlike... <laughs> Uh, I, I wish everyone in, in the body of Christ was on fire for Jesus, like crazy on fire, right? That'd be awesome. But, it's, but the fact is that not everybody is, but he is. And he's hungry. And he wants, to, he wants to get to know the Lord. And he wants to serve the Lord in a great way. He comes in like every two or three days. He's like, hey, man, give me some more business cards. I, gotta t I mean, He's handing them out to people, everyone that he meets. He's telling people about Jesus. He's telling people about Revolution Church. And I love this guy, man. That's fi that fires me up. That fires me up. So he's decided to make Jesus the Lord of his life. Yep. And he's being obedient to God's word. And he wants to be baptized. Is there anything you'd like to say? You don't have to. Just nope. lay, throwing it out there. You good? I'm grateful. I'm grateful to be alive. And Jesus has been by my side all this time. But I finally accepted. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You got a towel, brother? All right. Cool. All right. Come on in, man. Come on in. Have a seat. Turn around for me. <laughs> I want to make sure you remember it, bro. <laughs> right there. Perfect. Crisscross. Crisscross. All right. You remember this day, right? You remember this day. Uh, that's it for the rest of your life. You guys want to pray with me right now for David? Would you join me, please? Father, I just want to thank you for David. I thank you, Lord, that through all these years of all the choices that he's made, that, Lord, you have never left his side. I thank you for a praying mom who lifted him up year after year after year, day after day, day after day, and through tears and pain, Lord, she never gave up. And Lord, I thank you for honoring her prayers right now. Thank you, Lord, for being a God that does hear the prayers of your people and that you respond. I thank you for that. Lord, I ask that you would bless this man, Lord, that this time, right now, that he would never forget this moment, that this moment would be blazed into his memory for all time. And Lord, whenever he is tempted to do things that... Do not bring you joy. Lord, I pray that you would bring him back by your spirit to this moment when he gave himself to you. I thank you. Bless Amen. him, Lord, in Jesus' Amen. name. Amen. <laughs> David, who's your one and only Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ. Based on that confession, I now bury you with Christ, and like him, you'd be raised to new life because you, you trusted in God who raised Christ from the dead. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> awesome. Come on. Congratulations, brother. I have another shout for David. Who's happy that David's in the family? God is good. So go ahead, do whatever you want, man. This is your place. Yay! All right. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even know what she said, but it was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> All right, this is Mike. Say hello to Mike. Mike Schmidt. We, I've known Mike for uh, quite a long time now. When we were at our little building in Leesburg, our, our first building, um, he came in and introduced himself. He hung out for a few weeks and forever in my memory because I had a, uh, a switch in my office, a light switch, with wires hanging out of it. Because that's just the way I roll. Because I have no idea what I'm doing. Don't look at any of the trim in here. You'll know what I'm talking about. But uh, Mike fixed my light switch. And I'm forever grateful that I'm not dead. So I appreciate that. But Mike, uh, Mike came to me last week. 
and he told me he wanted to be baptized. Uh, now, Mike was baptized as a baby and doesn't really remember any of that. You know, it wasn't a decision of his will. It was the decision of his parents. And I commend them for that, for wanting, them to, for wanting him to be a Christian. That's awesome. But, you know, baptism really is for a person who makes a choice for Jesus. And then in obedience to his word, he seeks to be baptized. And that's what Mike has decided to do. So... That being said, is there anything you'd like to share at all? Um, I'm just, uh, God has shown me a lot of grace in my life, and it's just been a long road to get here. There was some really dark times in my life, and I'm just uh, very thankful that I'm, I, I met you, me Moses, too. and that um, I'm thankful for my family and everybody that's come into my life, and uh, I, I'm, I'm just ready to give my, the rest of my life to Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. All right, come on in, brother. Nice and chilly. Now, he works out in the heat all day, so he probably likes this. Yeah. He does. Now, let's pray for Mike, all right? Father God, we are so thankful for Mike. Lord, we thank you for this uh, blessed day. Lord, I am forever thankful for meeting him. Uh, Lord, he could have been uh, baptized at any church of your choosing, but yet you chose this church and this night, and we are all blessed because of the choice that you have made. Lord, we're also blessed because of the choice he has made. And today, we celebrate with the angels in heaven as a sinner turns from his sin and repents and turns to you. And Lord, we are thankful for that. Lord, I pray that you would bless him and help him to grow. Fill him with your spirit and fill him often, Lord. Help him to lead his family. Uh, let, him to, let him lead by example. Let, him, let, this, let his children see what it means to be a, a man of integrity and Christ-like character, a man who chases after the Lord with all of his heart. Uh, keep him there all the days of his life and help him to be a good dad. Lord, I'm just thankful for him. Lord, I ask for your greatest blessings upon him and upon his family. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Mike, who's your one and only Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Now, based on that confession... I now bury you with Christ, and like him, you'll be raised to new life because you trusted in the mighty power of God that raised Christ from the dead. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> awesome. 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 Now, it's kind of interesting. I told you we had two baptisms tonight. Well... It ended up being three because Mike called me and said, how about three? And I said, okay, who? Well, his daughter. All right, it's awesome. Now, we are a house that values the word of God. And the word of God does not say pastors baptize people, does it? Jesus says to his disciples, of which you now are, Praise to God. go make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teach them all that I have taught you. So I will happily step aside as Mike baptizes his daughter. Is my 
How about one more shout for what God's doing? Well, I don't know if I've met everyone, but my name is Moses. I'm the pastor here at Revolution, and I'm glad that you're here. Uh, what we do here at our church is we, we go through books of the Bible, and uh, God's Word is amazing. It is a light to our path, a lamp to our feet. It's all we need for truth and holiness, and that's what we do. And I just preached through the books of the Bible. We decided a while back that we're going to preach through the book of Ephesians. And so we started that a while back, and we've gotten to uh, Ephesians chapter 5, and I made a commitment to our church years ago that I wouldn't dodge issues in Scripture. I would just preach it, even if I didn't want to, even if it scared me, even if you didn't like it. Because I have a lot more fear of the Lord than I do of any of you, including my wife, and I'm going to face Him one day, and I have to be obedient to what he's told me to do. And so that's what we're doing. Now we're in Ephesians chapter 5. And Ephesians chapter 5, if you have a Bible, I would welcome you to please go there because we're going to spend some time in there tonight. As you could probably uh, guess, it's going to be a little bit different here tonight. I'm going to introduce you to our illustrious panel here in just a moment. Many of you know my, my wife, Meredith. Um, so, yeah, you can welcome her. That make, that make me happy. I, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and I'm going to introduce you to my, my guests here in just a moment, but they, they, they need uh, a few moments to, to introduce them properly. But um, we, we, we are going to uh, speak tonight about husbands and wives and marriage. Now marriage in America, in the Christian church, has fallen on hard times. And more than ever, we need the truth of God's word to speak into our marriages. The book of Ephesians was a book written to Christians to encourage them, uh, and they were actually doing pretty well, but God wasn't rebuking them or anything like that. He was encouraging them to do even better. And, and there's, a, there's a, a, a silver lining going through the first couple of chapters where it talks about being united with Christ. And that's what this letter was all about. It was a letter to the people, letting them understand that they are united, they're one with Christ, and that His church would be strong. And so He teaches us in this book how to be a strong church. And so, it, i got to tell you this, it doesn't make any difference what goes on in here if what goes on at home is a train wreck. And a lot of times you come to church and everyone has their church face on. Everyone, let me see your church face. Yeah, how's everything going? Oh, just fine. <laughs> Liar. <laughs> right? The car just broke down. The house is actually on fire when I left. I'm doing just fine. <laughs> right? So, so, so Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he takes some time to speak about the church at home, if you will. Before you all gather, we've got to get things right at home. And so we've got to hold the family together strong. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Now before we jump into Ephesians chapter 5, I want to, you can keep your, keep, keep your place there. But if you want to, if you want to be an awesome, awesome Christian, who wants to be awesome? Anyone want to be awesome? I want to be awesome. You can keep your finger, yeah. Keep your finger in Ephesians 5 and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I want to lay some foundation first. Before we get into Ephesians chapter 5, I want to lay some foundation for marriage. And then we're going to figure out how we're going to do this thing. Because Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 7 what we're to do. And then he tells us in Ephesians 5 how to do it. Okay? So let's start there. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. If you look at the second part of the second, part of the, of the second verse... It says this, and this needs to be spoken out loud, Christians. You ready? Each man should have his own wife, and each woman should have her own husband. That's the biblical marriage. One man, say one man, one man. and one woman. That's the way it is. That's what God <laughs> says, right? Now, this is my favorite part. You ready? Yeah. The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs. 
Come on, ladies. Let's hear an amen. Ow. Woo. All right, guys. You heard the ladies, right? You want to outdo them? Here we go. You ready? And the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. That was pathetic. Maybe that's why she's not fulfilling your needs. <laughs> this is a tough one in America. In, in America. You ready for this one? Say it. Right. Say it. America. America. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband, and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. That's a tough one in this country. Now, Meredith and I have a little expression. I think I may have shared it with our church in the past. But we, in my house... I don't know how much of a good deal she's getting out of it, but I always say I'm owned by God and managed by Meredith. Now, I don't know if you're doing really good here. I definitely got the better end of that one. But that's the way it works. God has purchased me at a price. The precious blood of Jesus. So I am owned. I am no longer my own. I am owned by Christ. But I'm run by her. She says what goes with my body. <laughs> I might preach this every week. All right, you ready? Laying down the groundwork here, just the, just the foundation. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations. If that doesn't get an amen, I'm leaving this building right now. Come on now. Come on. Now listen, there's, a, there's an exception here. Unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time. It's funny, my version says for an extremely limited, almost non-existent time. What, does yours say that? Mine says like hardly ever, just for maybe a moment. No, I'm just kidding. Refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can, listen, there's a reason. Uh, so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. Now, I can't speak... As a woman, I can speak as a man in open honesty. I don't see kids' kids here, but um, sexual drive can be a distraction from things, right? When you've got your mind set on something, guys, nothing else even is even around. You don't even see anything, right? It's like the world is not even existing anymore. So if we're going to give ourselves completely to prayer, we want to take a, a break from sexual relationship. But then it says, after this time of prayer, you should come together again, amen, amen, so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So you don't want to spend too much time away from the marriage bed with your spouse because you can get tempted to, to go elsewhere, and we don't want that. God doesn't want that, so he says, get back together again. Now, if you jump down to um, chapter uh, 7, verse 10, this is, it says here, but for those who are married, all right, so it's, this isn't for everybody, but there, if you're not married, you may be someday, and so you need to heed God's word too. But this says, for those who are married, I have a command that comes not from me, but from the Lord. So, so even though the Bible is, is inspired by God, every word is His, Paul wants to make sure that you're paying attention to this. But no, no doubt in your mind, this is not coming from any man. This is coming from... From God, a wife must not leave her husband. And at the end of verse 11, the very next sentence, it says, And a husband must not leave his wife. Now, for those of you that call this church your home, you know me. And you know of my failures. And you know of Meredith's failures. I have failed many times in marriage. Before I was a Christian, I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know any of this stuff. And so I had no moral compass. I had no clue. But by God's grace, He's given me another chance. Amen. Amen. And she is hot. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. God is good. All the time. All the time. <laughs> Whew. Okay. I'm totally derailed now. Okay, so God is good. Yeah, God is good. But, oh, that, this, that's it. Yeah, so, so I'm not preaching from, from uh, expertise. I'm not preaching because I got married one time, and I'm, I've got it down pat, and I know how to do it, and you just follow me, I know how to do it, because that's not the way it is, because I was a complete failure. I failed in marriage several times. 
total failure. But I don't want to fail again, right? I don't want to fail again. And so I want to heed God's word and honor God with our marriage right now. And so I want to tell you, for those of you who have left a spouse, okay, it's wrong. But God's grace is abundant. And you can start honoring him now. If you haven't in the past, he's given us the gift of repentance. We turn from what we've done and we start afresh, honoring him. Now it tells us not to leave our husband and wife. But I want to tackle one thing before we start a discussion. I need to do this because it's been, it's, it's, it's been hounding me for, for years. And so I'm going to just come right out and I'm going to talk about this. People say, well, when, when, when can I get divorced? How bad does it need to be to be divorced? He committed adultery. She committed adultery. I'm free to go. God's word says I can go. I want to read something to you. It's in Matthew 19. If you want to, you can turn there. I would recommend it because you shouldn't just trust what I say when you have God's word right in front of you. Matthew chapter 19, Jesus is speaking. We should pay attention. 19 verse 6, it says this. Since they are no longer two, but one, husband and wife, let no one split apart what God has joined together. And since, then some people ask, because we're always looking for an easy way out, right? That's just the way we are. Well, then why did Moses say in the law that a man could give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away, they asked. And Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts, but it was not what God had originally intended. So it goes on, it talks about adultery. So if, if, if someone in the marriage commits adultery as a concession to your stubbornness, because of your unwillingness to reconcile, because of your unwillingness to look at your pile of sin that God forgave, and you're okay with that, but you're not okay with the one who did this one thing to you. If you're that stubborn, God says, go ahead. But that's not what I had planned. What I bring together, let no man separate. It's a holy union. The ancient Hebrew talks about the two becoming one as the mingling of, of souls. That's how tight of a relationship this really is. One last verse I want to read to you before we speak here is in Malachi chapter 2, Old Testament, one book. And in the Old Testament prophet Malachi chapter 2, verse 15, he says, Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and spirit, you are one. And what does he want? Godly children from your union. See, he wants you to create more worshipers of him. That's why he brought us together. So guard your heart. Remain loyal to the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce. I hate divorce. So it's, it's not what he wants. And he allows divorce for adultery only as a concession because you're stubborn. What he wants is you to let the gospel invade your marriage and realize that even though you didn't deserve it and you have, you have offended a holy and perfect God time and time again, and yet he willfully goes to the cross to forgive you, that you would do the same for your adulterous spouse and forgive. The heart of the gospel is reconciliation. And that's what he wants for your marriage. Okay. Now, keeping that in mind, it did mention there that we should be, remain faithful to the wife or the spouse of our youth. And so it's at this point, I'd like to introduce you to a couple that have somehow, some way, pulled that thing off. This is Elmer and June Wolford. Please welcome them. <laughs> Years ago, when I was the associate pastor at a church in Mount Dora, I had the opportunity to not only meet start dating my wife at that place. That's where it all happened. So that was the reason for it. We were, I think we were searching for a reason why all that craziness happened. That's why. But I also got to meet them. Now, uh, when I met them, 
they're, they're up in years. They've been married for a while. And I know he was a pastor for a long, long time, and I had the joy of meeting them. Um, and I always envied their relationship with one another. The way they conducted themselves together was just truly beautiful. And uh, some things happened. I hadn't seen them in several years. Well, it was a couple months ago. I was over at Avante, which is a rehabilitation center uh, for injury and, and illness over in Mount Dora. I was visiting someone in our church, and I looked across the room, and there they were. I hadn't seen them in years. I, I, it was just amazing. And, and I go over, and, and there's Elmer sitting with June. And I went over and said hello to him. Do you remember me? Yes. And clear as they were always. And I come to find out that June had been in there for a while. But this is what, this is what a husband's supposed to do. Every single day. This, is, this floored me. Every single day that June was there. He would wake up in the morning at home, rush to Avante, and sit by her side, and never leave her side till dinner. And then when she'd go to bed, he would go home and come back the very next day. He never, ever leaves her side. Now, the Bible says you're supposed to be faithful to the wife of your youth, right? Would you please tell us, Elmer, how many years you've been married? Is this on? Yes. Okay. Well, I'll tell you this. We are happy newlyweds <laughs> of only 71 plus years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> only. Well, I've asked, as I, as I was researching this, this week, getting ready for tonight, they popped right into my head. I was like, if anyone could show someone how to do this thing right, it's Elmer and June. Amen. And so I reached out to them, and they were a blessing, and they decided to come and join us. And so as we uh, just, I asked them if we could just walk through Ephesians chapter 5 together, husbands and wives, and get your input and uh, your perspective and any advice you'd give, and also that's what we're going to do. So if you have your... Uh, Bibles, open to Ephesians chapter 5, uh, starting, uh, starting here, uh, look at the, look at these, uh, chapter 5 verse 21 is where it says husbands and wives, right? But here's the thing, just before it, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God uh, Paul writes, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit because you, what you're about to hear is not something that we can easily do. And we need God to help us do it. And so this is what I want to do. I want to just take a moment, just a moment, and pray with you. And ask God, right, to fill you with His Holy Spirit so that when you hear this, you'll want to do it. The reason why it's in here is because you don't want to do it. So we need God to help us. Amen? All right, so let's pray. Elmer, would you do me a favor? Would you lead us in prayer yes. to be filled with the Spirit, please? Heavenly Father, as we come to you just now, we come with realizing you are the one in charge. And Father, I just want to tell these people that at breakfast time, when I pray and thank you for the food that you've made available to us, I at that time say, fill us with your spirit today, Father, because that's the way we want to live. We want to walk with you. We want you to be our hand holder we want to look at you we want to just want to be what you want us to be today without just trying to do it on our own we want you with us we thank you for your love your blessings we realize father that it just it takes every second of every day that you are with us that keeps us happy and when we are not trying to be what you want us to be, we are very sad because we let us by ourselves get in front of you. And that is so wrong, Father. So just help us now that from this point forward as we live life on a daily basis, every one of us will say, Lord, I'm walking with you today. I want you to be 
totally filling my spirit with your very self. Thank you now for this time we have together. In Jesus' precious name, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. All right, so we're here in Ephesians chapter 5, and it just basically says this. I'm just going to read a little bit, and then we'll, we'll just have a little bit of a chat, okay? So it says, uh, Further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so what I want to do, I'm going to ask you first, Meredith, I know you've taken some time to talk, uh, talk a little bit about what it means to submit to one another. What does it mean to submit? I know it's your favorite subject. It's my favorite yeah. subject. Am I, is this one? Yes. Okay. Uh, submit means to yield to authority or be accountable to another. So I was like, okay, well, yield. What exactly does yield mean? So I had to look up yield. You're going to like this. Give away to arguments, demands or pressures, surrender, submit, relent, admit defeat, back down, climb down, give in, give up to struggles, lay down one's arms. You're really good at that. Yeah. I just lied. <laughs> I told you to hold the Bible up there when I tell you it's not always the truth. Well, she struggles with that, but she's, I do. she's, she's getting, a, you're getting a lot better. I mean, it's been a really, an amazing work. It really has. I've watched it. I think as we become closer to our Heavenly Father, it makes us easier to become closer and, and put ourselves in that position of submission to our husbands, especially when we realize that, that God's, it's not coming from Him. It's coming from Christ. So it does say to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So Elmer and June, whoever, however you'd like to do this, when you talk about, when you think about submitting to one another out of reverence for, I mean, what is your motivation when you submit? Like Meredith just explained, when you do these things, when you give in and you back away, um, what's the motivation behind it? You gonna need your microphone, hon. Well, mostly I guess it's because okay. the microphone, so. Miss June. Thank you. I guess mostly it it is because uh, we feel that that if we don't, we might be doing something wrong. That you have to stand up and be counted and be make sure you're on the right side. And uh, and as long as we feel like we have are okay with God, then we can be helpful to the our mate to help them start feeling thankful that uh, we can get along, you know, with God, even if we can't get along with them once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't happen, though, does it? You always get along perfectly, right? 71 straight years. Oh, well, we, we've had our ups and downs. Yeah. <laughs> But we don't go to sleep at night, you know, without uh, meeting and, and uh, making sure we both are okay and like that. But I feel we're just very lucky to have him. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask a question. How many of you have no ego? Raise your hand. If you have no ego, raise your hand. I have an ego. You got one? Yeah. Yeah. Well, after we had been married for a few years, our eldest son was about five and our twins were only three. And one, one day she says to me, Honey, that particular way that you do stuff, would you please try not to do that anymore like that? <laughs> She said that. Can you imagine her asking me to change? <laughs> well, she did, and I said, oh, I understand what you're saying. And I, I, I can realize that that's not a, a good way to do. I'll, I'll, I'll work at that, I'll change, I'll, I'll, I'll be better. Give me a few, a few weeks here and I'll, I'll see that that's 
Changes. Give me a few years or decades. <laughs> oh, come on. It only took six months. We had the same... In six months, we had the same conversation. <laughs> Is he still working on it, June? Is he still working on it? He might be. <laughs> so I said, oh, I understand. I didn't get that done yet, did I? And she said, no. Why didn't you say yes? Because it wasn't done yet. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'll work on that. I'll just, I'll just get right at that and work on it. Well, did I work on it? Six months later, we had the same conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I hadn't changed yet. Why? Because of me, my ego. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. I realize that uh, something has got to change, and that's me that's got to change, or this thing's going to keep on going on forever. She says, I realize that too. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a change. Six months later, we had the same conversation. <laughs> and then I said, okay, you realize what I realize? I can't change. I can't do it. I have to his, he, have his help in order to change, and so do you. If there's any changes that need to be made, don't try to do it yourself. Get his help. Amen. That's where I had to go. And after a week or two, I, she says, oh boy, that's much better now, isn't it? <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> you and I are egotists. We want, to, we want to be in charge. We don't want him to be in charge. We want to be in charge. But the Lord says, I have to be number one. Mm -hmm. And when he is, then we can be number two or three or four. And it doesn't matter Amen. as long as he's number one. Amen. Besides him being number one, she's number one. <laughs> and that's okay. Actually, it's a, a number two because he is number one. See that one finger up there? That's him. Mm -hmm. And she is number two. So that's how come we have how many sons? Five. Because she submitted. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> awesome. I, um, let, let, let's read on here, okay? Um, okay, so it gets a little specific. So first it's submitting uh, to one another out of reverence for Christ. So we're submitting to one, one another, not because of who the spouse is, but because of who Christ is. And so when you let the gospel invade your marriage and he becomes your Lord and Savior, He becomes the Lord and Savior of your marriage as well. And so you submit to, him, to each other because of your love and reverence for Christ. So, but now it goes on to talk specifically to the wife. And um, no, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with, with, uh, with Meredith and then Miss June. Uh, it says here, for wives, this means submitting to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. Now, this is, this is, he really tightens down the screws here. He says, as the church submits to Christ, so, so, the, so Christ is the head of the church. He's the mind. He's the director of it. He's the one who decides what it does, right, and what it's going to look like and how it functions. Amen. And we're supposed to submit to that. And so as the church submits to Christ, just like that, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Now that is not a popular teaching in America where this enlightenment mentality puts us at the center of our universe and to tell someone that they're to submit to another in everything is a bold statement. But for for you to sit on a stage and say we've been married for 71 years, you got to do this. And so I want to ask you, 
because I'm sure others in the crowd are asking this already. Well, what if my husband, and then they fill in the blank, what if he does this? What if he does that? Like, where's the line that we're supposed to draw? Now, the scriptures are clear about a lot of things, but in, in this, it's not clear. There's no specific line. How far can the husband go before the wife finally says, enough? So I want to ask Meredith first, what does it look like for you to submit to me in everything? How does it make you feel? Because I'm sure others can identify with that. And then, how do you pull it off? Well, number one, submitting for me is very difficult. <laughs> Uh, I have a hard time with you telling me what to do. Um, but, as, like I said, as I've grown closer to Christ and understanding that, like Miss June was saying, it's only going to, to better my relationship with Christ. Like, I'm not, I, because I'm submitting to Him, I'm doing what God has asked me to do. And so it's becoming easier and knowing that God's put him in my life as my spiritual leader. Like I go back to that constantly. And I, you know, there's things that I that I question or there's things that I that I'm talking to God about. And since, you know, God doesn't always speak to us, you know, he doesn't come down and talk to us anymore. I know that he's put this man in my life as my spiritual leader. And so when I'm talking to God, I'm like, okay, Lord. I'm going to go to Moses with this, and I'm going to believe that you've put him in my life as my spiritual leader, and whatever he says is coming from you. Now, that's up to him. It may be, and it may not be. Can you know, like oh, his? It's all from him. <laughs> it's all from him. But I've done what the Lord's asked me to do, and I've put myself in submission to my husband, who I believe that God's put there as a spiritual leader. Now, what he does with it and where his walk is with Christ, that's between him and God, and he's the one that's going to have to deal with that. But I'm doing what Christ has asked me to do, and that's submit to him. And it is difficult, and it is a learning process, and it has taken me a long time. Um, one of my scriptures is a quiet and gentle spirit that is so precious to the Lord. I have to repeat that constantly in my head because I'm not quiet and gentle. He says, Meredith, be quiet. And I'm like, but, and he says, no. And I'm like, you can see her, her top lip gets really thin and tight. <laughs> and it almost has a quiver to it. That's when you just run. You just run. If you see that lip, just, just run to the other end of the church. But God is good. Yeah. And um, he's doing a work in me. And so, like I said, because of my relationship to him and because I do want to be obedient to Christ like that is my first and only desire is to be obedient to Christ and when I read this and he tells me to submit to my husband as if he is Christ like I can see him as you know I need to envision him as my um, human Christ you know I mean because that's what God says here that he is so I have to picture him that he is Christ and that God has put him here as the one I'm submit to. Now, does it mean, and because I believe, and I'm very, very fortunate. I know there's others out there that don't have, a, you know, because then we're going to talk to how the husband's supposed to be. And I'm very fortunate because he makes it easy for me to submit. He makes it very easy. And he doesn't ask me to rub his feet or go get him a glass of tea. He asks me, honey, can I get you a drink? Because I'm getting a drink. And do you want a drink? Like, he does that. He doesn't preach lay back in his preach, chair preach, and say, preach. rub my feet, get a drink. Um, but as far as where that line goes, um, I... Me personally, and I, like he said, it's not clear. I don't believe that putting yourself in harm, like I don't believe your husband making you, this is going to be very 
but I don't think, you know, like swinging, like your husband telling you, no, we're going to meet up with this couple and this is what I expect, that kind of stuff. Like, I really believe that that's where the line is drawn, <laughs> you know, um, because that goes against God's word in the first place. So I think there are lines like that that, that can be put there. Um, but other than that, as far as like if he says we're not tithing, then okay, that's between him and God and I'm submitting to him. You know, um, those kind of things. It, I think putting yourself in harm is where the line is drawn. Because I don't think if he truly loved you, he wouldn't. Any, but any, never mind. <laughs> so, thank you. So, Miss June, if, if the Bible says that the, that, the, that, the, that the wife is to submit to the husband as unto the Lord in everything. But when, when where's the line? What, what if the husband does this or does that? I mean, when do you say... Because it doesn't say there's no line there in Scripture. So, in your opinion, what do you think the line is? When do you not listen and submit to a husband? Microphone, sweetheart. Your microphone. Oh. Thank you. Well, the way that, that I feel about it is, is when there is any difficulty between the husband and wife that, that they can't communicate decently, that, um, that I, I feel then like I have some work to do. <laughs> And, uh, and it's not necessarily because I'm at fault about everything, because I have went to him and told him, you know, I've got something that's bothering me that you do, and like that. And of course, he wanted to know what, what, you know. And, and so I told him. And, uh, and you got to do that quick, because it takes him a couple of years, obviously. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, he, no, he agreed with me, you know, that, that I was right, you know, that, that I part's easy, picked yeah. out. <laughs> I had picked up something, you know, that that uh, he had guess felt had little guilt feelings about, and so then when I mentioned it, you know, I then he felt more like doing something about it, probably. Yeah. But anyhow, uh, we we don't even have to worry about fighting or or being ugly with each other anymore, and I like that. Yeah. And, the fact is, he's easy to get along with. <laughs> he's sweet. I'll let you talk. <laughs> Elmer, what do you think? What's the, what's the line? What's your line? Everyone has to have a line, right? You got to have your own line. What's the line when a woman does not have to submit to the man? Well... I enjoy trying to do the good things for her. Yeah, he does. I'd, I'd rather do that than not do it because I found out something. When you do something nice for somebody else, that gives you happiness. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. How much happiness can I get? <laughs> Well, I, I maybe can do a little more than what I was doing and get more happiness. <laughs> I like happiness. And I like her to be happy. Now, once in a while, I talk too loud about something that's going on. And she thinks, oh. And I know she feels hurt about what I just said too loudly. Well, sometimes I'm not smart enough to get it changed around. So she stays kind of upset for a while. But if I, if I go out of my way to then try to be happy with her about something, she comes back with that smile. Look at that smile. <laughs> She is a wonderful gal, I'll tell you. I mean, <clears throat> you can't go through 71 years smiling all the time. How many of you want to do that? <laughs> you want to? It'll not work. 
because we have to just be ourselves constantly. And if your constant self is trying to get along with somebody special like this one, or the one that you have, you'll have to give something once in a while that you don't want to have to give. Like, give up. Or just not say something about what just happened or was said. Because did Jesus always say something about everything that happened to him? Every time? Everything that was done or said? Did not he allow some bad things to happen to him? Yes, he did. And he loved people in spite of the nastiness of their lives, the meanness they, they had. So it's up to us to do better. It's up to us to do better. Can I tell you a joke? Sure. <laughs> you can do whatever you want, brother. Well, President Bush took a vacation. He went over to Israel, and he went out on, on that lake, and he says, he got, a, he got a tour boat there, and and he saw that the captain of the boat was, was really having a good conversation with somebody on the tele telephone. And when he hung up, he says, who was that on the telephone with you? Moses. <laughs> <laughs> Moses? He said, yeah. Oh, boy, I sure would like to talk to him. So I'll see if I can get a hold of him. So he <laughs> dialed on the phone. You believe all this? He dialed on the phone and he, Bush would like to talk with you. Oh, okay, I'll tell him. He hung up. He says, you're not going to talk to me? No. He says, the last time I talked to Bush, I had spent 40 years in the wilderness. <laughs> <laughs> If you believe that, you'll believe anything. That's a good one. <laughs> well, El <laughs> Elmer, you touched on uh, giving something up sometimes for your wife, something that you hold precious that you need to, um, you know, uh, people say not to die in every hilltop, kind of, that's kind of what you're saying. Um, and that really sp that, that's really what the next topic is here. It talks about, of course, how wives should submit to their husbands as unto the Lord and everything. But then it talks about the husband. Now, how's, how, how can we pull this marriage off, husbands? This is what, well, this is what you're supposed to do. Uh, submitting to your wife out of reverence for Christ looks like this. It means that you love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And so that's kind of what you mentioned a moment ago about how he responded to people. Sometimes they were nasty to him. Um, and he didn't always bark back at them. You know, he, 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 he absorbed it. Um, it says that he gave up his life for the church to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body but feeds and cares for it just as Christ cares for the church and we are members of his body. So now that's the mandate for the husband. But I want to ask you, Elmer, uh, what does it look like specifically in your life? What does it look like to lay your life down and, and give up your life uh, for your for your wife now most of us won't be called to actually die like literally die like Christ did um, we may if someone pulls a gun or something like that but most of us don't have to do that but yet it says we should lay our life down as Christ did so can you speak a little bit about how Jesus laid his life down for his church and then and I'm not talking about the dying on the cross part but how he other things that he did and then what does it look like for you? How, have you? how have you had to lay down your life for Miss June? Well, I think that one of the things that 
that it's almost a continuous thing for a man walking around in the mall <laughs> or going to the beach. You see the nearly naked women. Are they nearly naked? I don't know. I don't look. That was, isn't that what you're supposed to do, right? You, can, you cannot help but see people. Oh. You can't help that. But you don't have to go back and look again and, well, oh boy, is she beautiful. Look at all that. Come on. You can say, I don't have to look at that. I'm not going to look at that. I'm going to stay right close to you, sweetheart. I'm going to look at you, not them. And I like it. <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine that? She likes that. And then I you're would, happy. I would think so too. <laughs> because I think Jesus realized all the complications that that very looking and ogling could cause to a person. What did he say about it? He said, it's just like it happened when you ogle that body. When you think, oh, would I like to get that one? home in bed. No, you don't. You don't want to do that. You want to keep thinking about him. First of all, get your ego out of the way. Let him be on the throne of your life. That's the only way you're going to be happy. If he's on the throne of your life. Well, one man said to God, Show me, and then I'll trust you. Now listen to what God said. Trust me, and then I'll show you. That's right. That's right. Now, Jesus, the Jesus didn't just go to the cross, but Jesus, the scriptures tell us, and we know the story of Jesus, that although he was God, he didn't hold on to that role. He actually came down here and lowered himself, took on a body, and became a servant to all of us. And so he, he gave up his privileges. And so um, as a man who's the spiritual leader of the house, yes, we're in charge. But that's not to be used to lord over and, and, and be a ruler like a dictator to your wife, but an opportunity to serve her. And so that's, Jesus is our example. And so as Jesus being our example of, of giving up his authority, if you will, to become a servant, that's what we're supposed to do. So that's what giving up your life is. And, and, in our, and, and it, just in our culture here, what does that look like? Um, most men love sports, so maybe it's you don't play golf every single weekend or go fishing or hunting every single weekend and you don't make... You don't take videos of a game and tape it over your wedding video like the song said. Like, Sometimes you just give up what you have the right to do because you want to do something for your wife, who according to scriptures, and it's true, is a treasure. Amen. She's a treasure. And so if she's a treasure, you want to you wanna serve her. You want to bless her. You want to do like Jesus did. Je what did Jesus do? He, he fed people. So that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to feed, provide for our wives. Make sure they have enough food and shelter and clothing. He also fed them spiritually. He taught relentlessly. And so it says here in the scriptures that he cleansed her with the word of God. So we're supposed to be our, if you're a husband, you're, you're your wife's pastor. I'm not. The husband is the pastor of the wife. And he's to teach her God's word. Some of our greatest times together is when we sit and open up the Bible and share God's word together. I, it, there's nothing, I'm telling you right now, there's nothing more beautiful than sitting and listening to her talk to me about how the Lord is speaking to her through the word. It, it's awesome. And it draws us closer together when we spend time with him like that. So, yes, Elmer. We look at what our parents did. You may be happy about what he did or she did. When I was a little boy, we had to go down several, several lots away from us 
to get the pump to get our water. So my dad carried two pails, empty pails. He put both of them on there like that. He carried that, took my hand, and we walked down to the corner of our, of our property. And then he said, okay, now wait here. And so he, he walked down those four lots, pumped the two pails of water, brought them both back. And when he got back to where I was, then I could walk back up to the house with him. Once a week, probably, maybe twice a week, that would happen. Now, when my boys were, my eldest was about 15, and my twins were 12, 13, they're two, two years apart, 15 and 13, we were living here in Florida at the time. And, my, and my, she says, you know what? You might be able to win all, of, all the young people in the church, but you might lose your, your own sons. How's that? Because you don't do anything with them. Well, I wasn't. She says, why don't you go out in the backyard and and throw the ball back and forth with them, play catch. She says, five minutes at a time is, is something that would be interesting to them and you would enjoy it, they would all enjoy it. I said, okay, I'll try that. And you never take them with, with you and ask them if they wanna go with you when you have to go to the gas station. Okay, Gary, I have to go to the gas station now. Would you care to go with me? Sure, Dad. So we drove to the gas station, got our gas, came back home. So he walked in the house and she says, how was it, how was it going to the gas station with your dad? Well, it was nothing. We didn't talk. <laughs> you see, what I was doing, the same thing I, my father had done with me. We didn't talk. And that's when she explained to me I was doing what my dad had done. Go out and play the, with the boys. Do something with them. Spend some time with them. And you know what? All my boys forgave me. Amen. They love me. They can't think of anything bad that I'd ever did. <laughs> well, I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for her realizing what I was doing incorrectly. Now, guys, if you've got somebody that needs to have some fun with you, do it. Okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, last, lastly, I just want to touch on this. It talks about um, loving her as you love yourself. Like, no one hates their own body, but feeds and cares for it. A man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. I know one of the things that's very popular um, amongst the, the population is that we don't have a very strong love for ourselves. We look at our flaws. And we don't think very highly of ourselves. So when you read a text like this about loving them like you love yourself kind of thing, well, it's like, well, I don't even love myself. So how can I love them? And I think we, in the past, having spoken to many about this text, a lot of people over-spiritualize it. And really, I don't think that that's what it is. I don't think it's, it's a very spiritual thing. I think it's a very practical thing. The text goes on and tells us no one hates his own body but feeds and cares for it. So to love your spouse, isn't it not just to provide and care for her? I mean, it's not something super spiritual, is it? It doesn't have to be super spiritual. But about, I, I try to get her to get out and get some new shoes. Because I think she needs some new shoes. I think that's a good thing to do. And every once in a while, every six months or so, we might go into Bond Worth and she might find something that she likes to wear. Put it on, try it out, see if it fits. See if it just tells you this is okay. And once in a while she finds something. I think it's up to us to encourage having what you need. You need shoes, you need a top, you need slacks, whatever. I don't mind. You see her shoes right here, Ellen? Let me show you something. 
Yeah. She must know June real well, because look at this. Yeah. I couldn't get her to go to the mall and buy a pair of shoes. You're gonna have to t June, you're gonna have to talk to her. <laughs> Maybe the other shoe's better. Let's see the other shoe. I may have glued that one. Yeah, this one's glued. It's broken down here. She needs some new shoes, Elmer. Yeah. She needs some new shoes. Well. She, she's got one pair of shoes yeah. with a hole right where the big toe is. <laughs> and it's not on purpose, right? Not on purpose, but she can't get her shoes. You going to say something, Mom? Yeah, find them. I did. Just um, going back to the submission. And at the end, it talks about, you know, respecting her husband. Um, it's not a devalue to yourself, ladies, to submit to your husband. I think we go into it and like, but if I do that, then who am I? And what right do I have? But if we look at Christ who came and he did nothing but submit to his father, he submitted to his father and it was not... A devalue to him whatsoever and I think when we remember what Christ did it makes it easier too for us to submit to our husbands yeah. and also we also have to remember what a hard decisions making decisions you know like big decisions it's hard for a husband and that's put on his shoulders and we have to remember that also that we need to be his number one cheerleader we need to make that weight light, not make it heavy. We need to encourage him as he's burdened with these big decisions as head of the household, as the spiritual leader, as the father. Uh, you know, that's all on him. And our job, ladies, is to make it easy for him to carry that weight. So just keep that in mind also mm -hmm. as... It's you not, go through. So it's not the wife's job to just tell them to do something different. It's actually, as a helpmate, it's to help us to do what God leads us to do. Yes. And that's not easy for everybody. No. But that's biblically what a wife is, is to be a helpmate. So when God tells the husband, this is what I want you to do, the wife is to come alongside of her husband and help them pull that thing off and make it easy for them to do it. So let's say this in close. Did you have something else you want to say? I was just going to say being their number one cheerleader. Amen. Thank you. You want to do a chair? No. Okay. Um, I will say this, and, um, and then we'll, we'll call it a night, but submitting, and I think you touched on it already, submitting to your husband in everything is hard for the ladies but you can husbands you can make it easy for her to submit in everything if she knows you're a man after God's heart if she knows that you are a man who has her best interest at heart then even if she doesn't agree with you all the time knowing where you come from she will more gladly submit to you but the opposite is true Listen, I'm supposed to love her like crazy, right? She can make it easy for me to love her like crazy if she is a, hel a proper helpmate. So if she's nagging and driving me crazy all the Why don't you do that? Listen, it's better to live on the corner of a roof than to live with a, a nagging wife. And, and no man can find it easy to love his wife like crazy when she's nagging him all the time. So to submit, you can make it easier for her to submit by pursuing Christ and showing how much you treasure her. And you can do this if the wife will submit. Amen? Amen. So it's a challenge for everybody and it's not natural. To want to do this all right so I'm gonna leave it this thing I'm gonna give you a moment please if you have one bit of advice the two of you for us how to pull off a successful marriage that honors God and attracts people to Jesus for 71 years you have the floor
I think the most important thing for every one of us is to believe in God, that He is our Creator, and that He loves us like the Scripture says He does. And say, Lord, I am yours. I'm going to live for you to the best of my ability. And that, that can only happen because of your presence in my life on a daily basis. Thank you, Father. Ms. June, what's your one bit of advice for us so we could have a God-honoring, lasting marriage like you've had? Mic microphone, please. Um, if I get upset, you know, and, and talk sort of ugly, I can't hardly stand me. I mean, I just just want to give everything up and call a day, and so uh, so what I do is I just kind of keep it a little bit on the quiet side. But if something bugs me, I just remember, it and then once in a while we'll have a little talk to, <laughs> together. And uh, and he's always he's always companionable and wants to you know listen and do stuff just like me. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking to him like that. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm just really lucky to have him. <laughs> and uh, I have no complaints, really. I just feel like I'm just fortunate and blessed. I agree. Yes. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest things that I've heard in a marriage, and I think it goes for life in general, you be Jesus and let God be God. Amen. Amen. Well, on that note, I want to uh, allow you to take a moment and thank Elmer and June and Meredith for coming up. I thank you.